living God, by the grace of your spirit. We long to have that full experience, that knowledge, that conviction, that certainty of what it means that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And that that resurrection, way back in history, touches and transforms our life today. As we engage now with your word, send your Holy Spirit, that it will throw light on what we hear and read, that we might know him and the power of his resurrection. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going fishing. Fishing. Now, there's nothing wrong with fishing, of course. It's a good thing to do. And just as a segue into what happens next, I went fishing on the morning I got married to Sue. Calm in nerves, yes. It's hard to describe how amazing it is to sit out on a cold lake in the early morning, untangling fish line. And then there's that feeling you get when you feel a tug on your line. Oh, the big one, you say. But when your catch comes close to the boat, you realise that all you've caught is a £10 pile of seaweed. Let's go fishing. Fishing was more than a hobby for Peter and the other disciples. They were raised on the Sea of Galilee. Their fathers were fishermen before them, so they became fishermen too. Fishing was how they put food on the table. It was their job. At least it was their job before Jesus called them to leave their nets behind. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men, or fishers of people, as we should say now. For three years, the disciples seemed to put their fishing careers on hold in order to follow Jesus. And what a memorable three years that was. They had front row seats to the powerful teaching and dramatic displays of divine power and the love of God at work. They drank the water that Jesus had changed to wine. They gathered up the leftovers of fish and the bread that Jesus fed the 5,000 with. They were on the boat when Jesus lifted up his hands and calmed the wind and the waves. They were there. That's the story. What a wild journey. Certainly a lot more exciting than on Tangley Fishing Land at four o'clock in the morning. But all things come to an end, I guess. What are we supposed to do now? I imagine the disciples asking each other, Jesus, he's different now. He just appears, then he disappears. We know he's alive, that's for sure. He even breathed on us the last time we were together, said he was giving us his spirit, said that he was sending us out just as the Father had sent him out. But where are we meant to go right now? What are we supposed to do? And where do we get to whatever it is that we're supposed to be going? You can ask that of yourself, as I do, as an individual. But you can also translate it and ask yourselves those same questions for you as a church. Where are we to go now? There was a disconnect, you see, in their mind. Perhaps you've experienced it too. It's one thing to believe in the resurrection, and it's another thing to know and realise what difference it makes to our lives, how it changes everything. I can just imagine Peter staring over the Sea of Galilee, you might like to look out to the lake over there, scratching his head. I guess I'll go fishing. We'll come, said the others, with no greater idea of what it might involve. Now the disciples are not turning their backs upon Jesus. They just didn't know what to make of this new reality. So best to go back to the things you're familiar with. Can't blame them, can you? And then we begin to see something of the enigma of Easter. The resurrected Jesus is so elusive. You'd think he'd make a dramatic curtain call or something like that. Waltz into an assembly of religious leaders, settle the matter straight away and say, remember me, I'm back. But he doesn't do that. 
Instead of knocking on Caesar's door, he quietly reveals himself to a small group of women. And instead of doing an interview with the Jerusalem Times, Jesus spends the day on the road to Emmaus with Cleopas and his friends. All very understated. We might say, all very British. <laughs> so as his disciples go fishing, he makes a fire and roasts some fish. Perhaps you sense, perhaps you feel, perhaps you know something of the ambivalence, the restlessness that the disciples must have felt. I mean, today you and I will go home for lunch. It won't take long, even as Anglicans, we've got an Easter season, but it won't take long for the Easter high to come to fade until next year, unless you know the power of the resurrection coursing through your life and calling you to a new place. I wonder what we might do in the same circumstances. Watch a film, check our work emails. We know that Jesus has been raised, but we don't always know what it means for us. Now, while I sometimes wish that the resurrected Jesus was a little bit more showy in his post-resurrection appearance, I've also come to appreciate the subtlety of Jesus' approach. The level of communication and the revelation that's going on in this passage of scripture are wonderful and amazing. It's one of the best passages around the Easter story. Jesus says very little but his presence makes a big impact. The disciples have been fishing all night, John tells us, but they haven't caught anything. This isn't really a surprise. That's not, that doesn't normally happen when you go fishing. Haven't you any fish? Asks the stranger on the shore. No, the disciples grumble back. Well, throw your nets on the other side of the boat. There's fish over there. Now, remembering that they didn't know who he was, when you're a professional fisherman, the last thing you want is some smart alley telling you what to do <laughs> to get the drift. And there are times when the Lord Jesus speaks into our lives and we really want to say, no, thank you, I don't want to do anyway. But this was one of those occasions where in spite of the fact it might not have gone down well, with a bunch of experienced, hardened fishermen who said, I'd be able to know you. <laughs> I'm not sure what's most surprising in this scene. The fact that Jesus gives advice to his aimless disciples, or the fact that his disciples actually decided to put the strange <laughs> words into practice. You might have felt that kind of strange reaction at times in yourself. But for whatever reason, they obey. They follow his instruction. And the moment they do, a giant school of fish swims right into their nets. The catch was so big, says John, that the disciples didn't have the muscle power, big guys, didn't have the muscle power to haul it in. It's this stranger on the beach. It is the Lord, said the beloved disciple. At this Peter quickly puts his clothes on and then he jumps into the water and begins swimming uh, toward the shore. And gasping for air, Peter stumbles onto shore speechless. He drifts, literally drifts, before the Lord Jesus. Moments later, the early disciples anchor their boat and join Peter on the, on the beach itself. 153 fish we've got, they tell Jesus. Come and have breakfast, he says. What's going on here? What is Jesus doing with his aimless disciples? The most obvious thing is that Jesus here is serving them. He had that servant heart and it continued from beginning to end. Notice that Jesus doesn't scold his disciples for returning to their nets. Rather, he meets them in their confusion. He knows that what they need is not a good scolding, but a good breakfast. Comfort food for the tired fishermen, grilled fish and toasted biscuits. 
We know that Jesus loved a good meal, but he's doing more in this passage than just serving out food. As he shows hospitality, he's also tending to the relationship that he has with them, to the very <laughs> souls of these disciples. Specifically, Jesus has his eye on Peter. And when I finished preparing this talk, I began to see how even at this point in time, Jesus is still coaching, discipling his followers. From beginning to end, he didn't just tell them what to do. He modelled it. He lived it out between them. He's doing that very thing here and now in that resurrection appearance. And the reason why he had his eyes upon Peter is because Peter has leadership skills. When he says, I'm going fishing, all the other disciples say, we'll go with you. But as a leader, Peter had already failed dramatically. Three times he denied his Lord. The beach meal is the context in which Jesus serves, ministers, coaches, and comes alongside, particularly to place Peter in his apostolic office. Do you love him? Asked Jesus. Yes, I love him, said Peter. Feed my lambs, said Jesus. Simon Peter, do you love him? Yes, I love you, said Peter. Attempt my sheep. Three times Jesus asked the question, and three times Peter replies, Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Then Jesus says, well, follow me. Get out of the boat once more and follow me. And as this scene unfolds, we start to see the wisdom in what Jesus is doing. It's in a non-judgmental way, in fact, a restorative way. He is recommissioning Peter and the other disciples. He's regathering his scattered team for breakfast. And he's reminding them of the original call to them when he said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men, fishers of people. And this is where the layers of communication in this passage really begin to pop up. In a way, the simple scene becomes almost a parable of the disciples' mission in the world. Aimless and confused, they decide to go fishing. They get nowhere, to no avail, all toil and no fish. And this is what Jesus said to us will happen if we go out on our own. He says to us, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But take note, all saints, without me, you can do nothing. God has plans and purpose for individuals in this congregation. Specific callings for some to embrace for the future. But he has a calling on you as a whole church to look to that future and realize that you are recommissioned for a new season, to follow Christ in new ways. But he would say this, but not from me, no fruit, but not from me. If you abide in me and listen to my words, throw your net on the other side of the boat, you will bear much fruit. So Jesus is again wearing many hats in this sea. He's the servant who graciously offers hospitality to the discouraged. He's the servant leader who recommissions those who actually failed him. But he's also the servant leader teacher who gives his disciples a tangible reminder that ministry is only fruitful when pursued in union with him. That's why Anglicans have seasons for the year. That's why we wait for the ascension, for the ascended Lord, no longer to appear to his disciples and for the day of Pentecost. <coughs> they all belong together. When he calls you to go fishing, he will send his spirit that you might catch others. For the kingdom. And he still works that way today. 
Because he's alive and not dead, of course you won't find the resurrected Jesus cooking breakfast for you. But if your senses are attuned, you may just notice him attending to you. You may notice him washing your feet in this service of Holy Communion today. Ministering, serving you, recommissioning you, reassuring you, and giving you a bigger picture of what it is to be a Christian and a church that you tend to work on. As I was writing this sermon, I came across the story of a lady called Anne. It's creatively articulated in a very honest book she wrote called Telling Mercies, Travelling Mercies. Before Anne was called, called ashore, as it were, by Jesus, she led a very self-centered, carefree life. She wrote books, she smoked pot, she hung out with her progressive people in a little coastal community. Life was chilled and pleasant. She wanted nothing to do with God and considered all religion to be frankly, possibly <coughs> ridiculous. Then she started to stop outside a little church building, probably one that was open a bit like this. She enjoyed the singing. Sometimes she even went inside, but she always left before the sermon because she knew it was going to be stupid. <laughs> and then one night, after a raft of bad decisions and some serious emotional pain, Anne experienced the presence of Jesus <laughs> on her own, in her room, at home. She experiences Jesus so acutely that she actually turned on the lights. She could see no one, but this is how she described the experience <coughs> in her book. I knew beyond any doubt that it was Jesus. I felt him as surely as I felt my dog lying nearby as I rocked this, and I was appalled. I thought about my life and my brilliant, hilarious, progressive friends. I thought about what everyone would think of me if I became a Christian, and it seemed an utterly impossible thing that simply could not be allowed to happen. And so I turned to the wall and said out loud, I would rather die. The next morning, I actually woke up. But the experience of Christ's presence didn't go away. Jesus kept following her around like a stray cat looking for a home and kept pushing. She kept pushing him away and said, because I knew what would happen, you let a cat in one time, give it a little milk, and then it stays forever. She wasn't having that. A week later, she found herself at church again. This time, she stayed for the sermon, which she again thought was pretty ridiculous. But the song following the sermon was so raw and honest that she broke down and cried. On the way home, she felt the presence of Jesus following her again. But instead of trying to keep Jesus out, Anne began to open herself up to him. She lingered in the doorway of a house for a while. And then after a minute or two of silence, she said, all right, I quit. You can come in. Jesus called to Anne, welcomed her to his table. He recommissioned her as an author, gave her a mission bigger than serving herself and her son. That is the risen Lord Jesus. The risen one continues to call people to himself, welcome them to his table, and then recommission them for his mission in the world. Now, most of the stories that I've shared with you over these last few Sundays have related to the first steps of becoming a Christian. He works out this throughout our Christian journey of his recommission, his serving, his generosity calling you to share the mission, comes to those of us who've been at this Christian stuff for a very long time. Hear his voice, like the cat, once you let him in. <laughs> so today, I honestly believe that in this lovely setting, and as Sue and I come to the time where our time amongst you is coming to a close, you have a new call. 
You have the hospitality of the Lord's table beckoning you to follow him in the new future. And you have a responsibility to each other, not to just say, I'll do this, but to help one another to be full out followers of Jesus in whatever way that looks. Thanks. I'm going to